Okay, live stream is started. Live stream is started. Um, oops.
you're muted. <laughs> Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Lee Jerome, your host, a New York-based mixed media and installation artist and founder and CEO of Relational Space, a nonprofit gallery in New York that facilitates collaboration between artists, scientists, policymakers, and activists to co-curate immersive installations with evidence-based narratives to promote social change, most recently curating the VR exhibit Long COVID We Are Here. I also hold a PhD in clinical psychology with expertise in intersectional collaboration, art, culture, and behavior change, knowledge clusters in virtual environments, psychophysiology, empathy, and women's health. I contracted COVID-19 in March of 2020 and have been struggling with long COVID for 23 months. As such, I've become a long COVID activist and a moderator with Body Politic. A bit about Body Politic. Through a global network of COVID-19 patients, chronic illness allies, and health and disability advocates, body politic continues to break down barriers to patient-driven whole person care and well-being, particularly for historically marginalized communities. By facilitating peer support, cultivating patient-led research and public education, and as a champion for community-based advocacy, now it's my great honor to introduce and welcome Dr. Porges. Stephen W. Porges, PhD, is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where he is the founding director of the Traumatic, Traumatic Stress Research Consortium at the Kenzie Institute. He is a professor of psychiatry at the University of North, North Carolina and professor emeritus at both the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Maryland. He served as the president of the Society for Psychophysiological Research and the Federation of Associations in Behavior and Brain Sciences, and is the former recipient of the National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Development Award. He is the originator of the polyvagal theory that emphasizes the importance of the physiological state in the expression of behavioral, emotional, and health problems related to traumatic experiences. He's also the creator of a music-based intervention, the Safe and Sound Protocol, which is currently used by more than 1,500 therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, to reduce hearing sensitivities, and to improve language processing and spontaneous social engagement. Before we get started, I want to remind you that Dr. Porges is unable to provide individualized medical advice. However, if you have a general question that you would like to ask relevant to today's topic, please type it into the chat box and we will try to respond to as many as possible. Dr. Porges, hello. We're so honored to have you with us today to discuss COVID stress and coping mechanisms from the polyvagal perspective. Well, thank you for inviting me. And as you went through the introduction, I'm realizing how synergistic uh, COVID, uh, ex the experience of the pandemic is with understanding or demystifying that with understanding polyvagal theory. So on, in a very, let's say, uh, uh, functional level, and I don't want to remove the importance of empathy and feelings and compassion, we can see the theory acted out in how we react to the pandemic. So I think we're going to have an interesting dialogue that will be quite relevant to your own personal experiences, and I will share mine as well. Yeah, we're very excited to have you here, and I think everyone who's watching this feels the same way. Um, so shall we jump right in? Sure. Great. Okay, we're going to start with a few overarching questions. Um, as humans, <clears throat> our nervous system is tuned to detect safety and danger, integrating the body and the brain uh, through the autonomic nervous system. Perhaps you could start us off with a brief overview of the ANS physiology and how it coordinates brain and body sure. functions. Let, let's start with saying that many of the functions or if not most of the functions of our bodily organs are regulated by the autonomic nervous system. In a sense, it's a system that supports health growth and restoration up to a point. And that's the point we want to get at. And the issue is the system is also sensitive to cues of threat 
and sensitive to cues of safety. And polyvagal theory emphasizes both. In the world of stress, we think of only our body reacting to threat. But polyvagal theory, which is based upon the evolutionary changes or repurposing of our visceral nervous system, links uh, the mammalian system as a repurposed uh, system that links sociality with our bodily functions. So when we're ill, we're not very social, but when we're isolated, we affect our organs as well. So we start learning that there's a bi-directionality and that sociality is really a neuromodulator that facilitates our health. And the other un un important underlying concept is we can't think of what's going on in the world outside the body and our behavior, which is outside our internal physiology, as not being dependent on our physiology. When our physiology gets into states of threat, we get very biased. And so if you're experiencing long COVID, uh, you have a sense of personal isolation. You've gone through many psychological experiences that are far from feeling safe in the world that we're in. And what you learn from being ill is that our nervous system is trying to really serve us in the best way it can. And it goes down to the most foundational survival mechanisms. It's trying to keep you alive. And so if you have a pathogen, how do you get rid of that pathogen? You have a fever, your body goes through a various, you have inflammation, uh, which is part of the issue with COVID. And then when the pathogen is no longer viable, in many situations, our bodies become normalized. But in many cases, even though the pathogen is gone, we're left with a chronicity of illness. So when people have chronic pain, it's not that they have tissue damage or uh, let's say any type of real injury, it's healed, but the body didn't get the message. And I want you to take this theme with long COVID. Uh, the body didn't get the message that you're not sick. And uh, it, it's not that we haven't found the virus. It's just the system thinks it's still under siege. And what we're going to discuss, I hope, is how do you convince your nervous system that it's safe to come out and play again? Well, that's what we're all interested in hearing, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, yeah. So polyvagal theory provides a neurobiological model to explain the vagus nerve's role in maintaining our ability to feel safe and thrive. It also explains crisis and threat and how it interrupts the regulation of our um, emotions and behavior. So just, can you tell us more about polyvagal yeah, theory? Yeah, I'd like to even uh, make it more basic. I think there's too much emphasis <clears throat> on the vagus itself without understanding what the vagus is doing. The vagus is a superhighway, a bi-directional superhighway. It's containing our surveillance system of our bodily organs, sending it to the brainstem, and then taking signals that are in our brainstem, often coming up from higher level parts of our brain, back down to our organs. So if the brain makes this determination through many different inputs that you're under threat, it's going to change how you regulate your gut, how you regulate your heart. And we can take models of this. We can think of the child who doesn't want to go to school and has chronic abdominal pain. We can think of the person who has fear of public speaking and they start sweating and having a fast heart rate or passing out. And we have all seen people like that. There's, there, the threat is, quote, imaginary, but it's not. It's a real threat to their nervous system. And we'd be a more sensitive, more compassionate and wiser culture if we basically respected what people's bodies are doing and tried to learn from that and help them re-educate themselves. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I really look forward to us getting into that more, you know, as we yeah. move through these questions. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to add one other thing. We all come from a culture that says, if you have certain feelings, forget it, get over it, move on. And it, we have to really unpack that and understand what is that doing to us? Well, it's turning off our feedback systems because our feelings are really our autonomic nervous system projecting information to our conscious brain. So when we feel safe, our autonomic nervous system is doing what it's supposed to help us stay healthy. And when we're under threat, it's doing what it's supposed to do as well. Stop keeping us healthy, and enable us, divert the resources to fight off a predator. Very important for the short term, but for the long term, if we're locked into thinking, or let's say not thinking, because it's not conscious, locked into our body, 
detecting threat where there is no threat, we're a mess, we can't function. And we know that, and now we start making it worse because we start blaming ourselves. We use this big intentional brain and says we should be able to do it as opposed to listening to what our body is trying to tell our brain. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, that is really the basis of pacing is trying to, you know, listen to what we need versus. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Honor what your body is telling you. Listen and honor it. And then as you understand it, the next word I use is navigate. So you start respecting what your body is telling you. So if you're, let's use a uh, social anxiety one, you don't keep pushing yourself into that. You start understanding what your body's trying to tell you. And then you say, can I calm my body? And how am I when I calm my body? Like through breathing or moving or even being touched or touching someone that you feel safe with. Does that give you enough resource to regulate? And this brings us, well, we'll go into this more at time, this whole notion of co-regulation and the fact that we as a social species literally prefer co-regulation rather than self-regulation. But the society is very self-regulated oriented. So we have to understand there's frequently a mismatch between our DNA, what our nervous system evolved to do and the demands that our intentional a conscious brain tries to place on our body. So when you talk about co-regulation, you're talking about a reciprocity mm -hmm. um, uh, that helps to optimize homeostatic functioning. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe you can tell us more about that. Well, you know, we start off by thinking about uh, what's the model we want to use. Well, the model is start looking at that infant that's born. The infant that's born is going to need co-regulation, but the infant is also sending cues to the mom and to the father. So if the baby is cooing or smiling or physically conforming, the parent feels just wonderful. But if the body of the baby gets rigid and they're into a tantrum, you don't feel good. So there's a bi-directionality and we continue to use proximity and coupling or hugging as co-regulatories, even as we get older. And it's important, but, you know, in the world that we all live in, we know that there are people who give good hugs and then there are other people. And what's the difference? The difference is not the intention. Many people whose hugs are, you know, they're giving them, there's rigidity and there's defensiveness in the body and you're feeling it. Although the intentionality is to be safe in the arms of another. And I like to rephrase that and say, safe in the arms of another appropriate mammal, meaning that people who have difficulty with humans may feel fine with their dogs, cats, or horses. Sure, sure. Maybe, and I think that really leads us into help trying to understand what human resources are available to us that might mm. mitigate the potentially devastating reactions to threat that destabilize the ANS and create organ and mental health. Yeah, I think the first part, uh, the latter part of your statement is the first part of the response. And that is that we have to honor it. We have to understand that our body is trying to keep us alive. These are survival. These are foundational, evolutionarily foundational reactions. And we are so overemphasizing, and we are in this conversation right now, the threat side of the equation. And what makes mammals so unique of the vertebrae from which they evolved from is that they not only reflexively respond to threat, like virtually every living organism, they also respond to cues of safety, like the baby who's crying in the mother's prosodic voice, intonation of voice. Clue number one, intonation of voice is powerful. It's not learned. It's part of our genetics. How do we talk to kittens and puppies? We use prosodic voices. Uh, but how do we talk to our children when they start losing their ability to regulate themselves? We become stern and we do not use intonation of voice. And we were basically adding threat to a destabilized nervous system already. And that's our educational model. That's our leadership model. It's all about if you punish a person enough or you humiliate them, they will rise above that and control their behavior. Now think about uh, personal experiences like that. And they certainly don't lead to uh, getting those internal resources. The internal resources come really, the most of them come when we feel safe in our own bodies. And remember, 
if we merely do a survey of people online, and I know the history of body politic really came out of feminism. And if we look at women's history in, in our Western culture, we know that over 25% of women have had relatively severe abusive histories. And that's powerful. Now, men haven't gone unscathed either, but it's like 15%. And the issue is these challenges, often early in life, result in that autonomic nervous system retuning from a welcoming system, accepting engagement, smiles, proximity, and the ability to conform to another body. It retunes the nervous system to be defensive. Now, what we're talking about, of course, a lot of people who are on know about because it's their personal life. But what most people don't know is that that personal history of defensiveness leads to how we've responded to the pandemic. And actually been conducting research on this. And so um, I also haven't traveled since March 2020 when I was in New York giving a talk, my last trip, my last talk. Um, but what we've learned in our research is that if you carry with you an adversity history, and what we're really starting off by saying is that many people have this, there are symptoms, mental health symptoms during the pandemic, not of individuals who did not get COVID, are virtually, they're related to that, uh, that early history. But when you dig deeper and ask the next question, if we look at a measure of their autonomic nervous system, their subjective views of their autonomic reactivity, we find out that virtually all the variants, all the predictiveness of abusive history is carried by the autonomic nervous system. It's really saying, did those abusive situations retune the nervous system from one of the accessible and welcoming or defensive, chronically defensive. If the nervous system is retuned to defensiveness, the mental health symptomatology during the pandemic has not been good. Right, yeah, it takes us right into this um, question. Let, let's move now to the questions from body politic um, and questions about COVID and long mm. COVID, which is just to explain yeah. to the audience, a multi-system inflammatory disease experienced by one in three persons infected by COVID-19 and expressed with severe vascular and neurological systems. Um, we, we, we don't have to make it complicated. What we can merely say is it's merely that our nervous system is still under a state of threat. If we talk about inflam inflammation, that's a threat reaction. If we talk about all the changes in the autonomic nervous system, including features of what are called dysautonomia, threat reactions. So the nervous system has retuned to be under threat. There's another important part of this story. And this is a study that we've uh, just recently finished. And it's really asking the same questions about who got COVID. So when we did our large survey, we reported only those who didn't have COVID. But over 100 people had COVID when we did the survey. And those people have different adversity histories. So it's like, it's like saying it's a pre-existing condition. Why is adversity history a pre-existing condition? It's a pre-existing condition because it retuned the autonomic nervous system to be in a state of threat. And now when the real threat comes, it overloads that system and its recovery function it is hard to come by. So, uh, and this isn't, we haven't really gotten into data collection on long COVID, but the, the stories are always very much the same of the interactions I have. And that is they're autonomic from my perspective, you can call multi-systems, uh, but really it's the body locked into a state of threat. Uh, perhaps you could share with us some practical polyvagal applications that we could use on a daily basis to cultivate a state of calm and well-being. Well, again, these become hard to implement when your body is truly in a state of threat. So telling someone to meditate or someone to breathe uh, while they're in a state of hypervigilance or feel that the world's imploding on them is not an easy thing to do. And so often people need 
uh, a co-regulator, a, a guide, a therapist, a friend in the space that they're in so that their bodies don't maintain a state of hypervigilance. So if you're next to someone and you're in a sense protecting them, they can calm down. Just like with dogs and cats and you know friends and children, if you're the responsible adult, their hypervigilance, their defenses can be automatically dropped. So we talk about breathing and meditating. Um, there's also listening and literally, I mean, every, the stories are all the same. And that is uh, if we can get co-regulation into it. And I would say the best metaphor or model, visual model of co-regulation is reciprocal play. If we think about playfulness and play as being sensitive to the other person's moves and intentions, and then appropriate reactions to them. That's also therapy. So the neural exercise of reciprocity is therapy. It's also playful. Uh, it's also dance. It's also playing games. It's this interaction of two nervous systems or more that are sensitive to each other and going through different states in appropriate sequences. So if you're mobilized, your body gets uh, more activated. Sure. It's calmed down through that social interaction. Right. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And I'm very excited about this idea of co-regulation, which I'm not sure has been um, talked about that much other than just, you know, talking about therapy in general. Um, I'm going to ask you another question uh, from our uh, body politic. One theory of ME-CFS is that it is the result of a fight or flight response gone haywire with the faint as the third fight or flight alternative. And there's been some hibernation studies to support this. For people with ME-CFS, do you think our brains think they're protecting us from something like keeping us in a limited state, like a computer in safe mode? The, well, I'm gonna say yes, but I'm gonna deconstruct it in a much simpler okay. way. It's basically what polyvagal theory tells you. It says that when we're under threat, the first reaction is a mobilization. It's sympathetic, it's, but it's metabolically costly. And this gets to your last point. You can't run forever. Your body is now going, but if your body's still under threat, it has this reflex of shutting down. And that's why certain people will faint. You know, there's, there's exercise-induced syncopes. You know, have people talk about that. But basically, it's the most primitive, evolutionarily oldest, defense system. It's a shutting down. It's autonomic. And it's to reduce metabolic output. It's, uh, so your, your explanation is correct, but there's a predictable sequence. So if the nervous system is in this dysregulated mobilization, first of all, social engagement is off the table. Um, and in, in a sense, awareness of others is often off the table. And the body is literally running out of its fuel. And the body is smart. So it adjusts. Now, there are people who have been under a severe threat and their bodies then go into, rather than collapsing, they go into a dissociative state where they still function, but they're really not there. And so this becomes this other uh, uh, strategy of survival, which is really not to feel for a degree of numbness. And in polyvagal terminology, what that is doing, it's turning off the uh, vital feedback loops that enable you to be healthy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It just mm -hmm. shuts down. Yeah. Okay. A common, and you, you have uh, addressed this briefly, but a common diagnosis that we see with long COVID is POTS, a form of dysautonomia. Yeah. Can you give us a brief perspective on this through the polyvagal uh, lens? It, it's the same thing. You know, it is a form of dysautonomia. It's where the sequencing of the autonomic nervous system is literally not adjusting. So I've been coming up with terms, like one term I come up with is a, uh, a metric. It's a way of measuring what I call vagal efficiency. And what vagal efficiency is telling you is when you change this vagal input to your heart through whether it's breathing, uh, neural stimulation or posture shifts, I, it has a linear effect on your heart rate. So if you increase the vagal activity, your heart rate slows up. If you reduce it, it gets faster. And what we find is that people with any, virtually any form of dysautonomia, or which can also be uh, 
starts with trauma histories. They start to decouple these systems. So they lose vagal efficiency. POTS is known where the posture shift doesn't do the predictable regulation. And so it's saying that it's reading the signal in a different way. And the question is what, inter I, the next question will be is what can you do to, to make it work better? Um, and the answer for all these become, is there a way to calm the autonomic nervous system down to recruit that uh, more mammalian, the new or ventral vagal circuit, which is linked to sociality and calmness. Right. And, and the answer to that is there are multiple portals that have been, I would going to say, known for thousands of years. And we can even go back to the history of yoga, which is all about recruiting, uh, at least pranayama yoga, uh, yoga of breath. It's recruiting the neural regulation of the striated muscles of the face. Now, why is that important? Well, that interesting story about how reptiles, how mammals repurposed the reptiles autonomic nervous system, they repurposed it by bringing the part of the vagus that will calm humans down to an area of the brainstem that regulates our, the muscles of our face. So by using muscles of the face, especially upper part of the face, the middle ear muscles for listening, uh, the laryngeal for vocalizations, we are functionally exercising the vagal control of our heart, we're calming ourselves down. Yeah. Sucking, swallowing, ingestion is really what many people try to do to calm down. And we call that eating disorders. But what we learn from the research with kids is that early infants, ingestion is the primary calming mechanism. You stick a nipple or breast and they calm down. But as they get older, it's not food that will calm them, it's the social interaction. So the social interaction is, has the highest priority in calming us down. Interesting. And things like uh, gargling and... Um, well, they're not bad. Humming I don't really and good. things like that. They're not bad. Um, humming is uh, what oming and humming, mm -hmm. utilizing the oral motor muscles, get into that system. Right. And so there's listening. So right. the technique that I developed was it's called the safe and sound protocol. And I was very interested in how you could in a sense trigger the system without uh, basically a, a stealth way of triggering the system because most of the people we're talking about feel that when they do things, they may not do it right or they're not getting the effect. So they're overly self-evaluative, which means they're already in a state of threat. So they're sure. not, in a sense, even accepting or honoring what their body's doing. So I developed a, a technique, uh, basically taking vocal music and then modulating and functionally amplifying the intonation changes. So in a sense, it's a amplified essence of trust in the human voice and bodies will relax and their hypervigilance. Now, this is a double-edged uh, mechanism because if you carry into the setting a history of abuse, mm -hmm. often the abuse was by someone that you trusted. So now you listen to this, your body becomes accessible. It opens up. And then you go through a physiological acknowledgement, you know, introception. I feel my body. My mm -hmm. body feels calm rather than the smile and say, oh, this is wonderful. The big brain, the intentional behaviors has got to get the hell out of here. Too dangerous, been there before. And we've seen this in working with people with trauma, but the skilled trauma therapist says, this is really remarkable because all we need to do is titrate it, do it very slowly. So you get used to the feelings of safety and then basically have more control. Now, the question is whether that will work with COVID, uh, with long haulers, COVID. Right, and there right, are right. several people using that amongst other types of treatments. So uh, there was a, one person who I actually was on a, a, a podcast with uh, recently, whose son, 18 year old son had COVID and used to listen to this and could breathe better while listening. So the issue is that, and then I got an email from a psychiatrist from Chile, 
whose husband was in the intensive care unit and they were playing the SSP form and his inflammations were going down. So we can't think of this as totally causal or cure, but we can say that we can give cues of safety in the body and right. start to incorporate that. Right. So it's part of this pathway that um, I actually even think things as simple as facial massage or neck, neck rubbing, um, uh, if we start thinking about how can I get signals into that brainstem area that turn off my threat responses. Makes right. so much sense. Um, it kind of, what do you think about things, um, emergent therapies such as electrical stimulation and stellate ganglion blocks, that kind of therapy? I know that my, my son has a patent on a vagal nerve stimulator, a closed loop using the ear, and a very good friend uh, actually developed a technique for stellate ganglion. Uh -huh. And I mean, all these things have their place. They all are helpful. But I would say that, that, again, this is very polyvagal theory oriented. You better have a good understanding of the physiological state the patient or client is in. Right. Because that physiological state is going to be a major determinant of whether that intervention is going to be well used. So it will be incorporated into that physiology of the individual to promote feelings of safety and, and enhanced autonomic regulation. And this is really what I actually learned this through, I would say, I would say mistakes, but I learned this through the trauma world that when the SSP created reactions that I didn't, didn't believe they could occur. Right. I had to, in a sense, be informed to learn that when we, our bodies are not prepared to be in states of safety, they're going to rebel. So I mean, from your perspective and for many of the listeners, they say, get me into a state of safety. I'm saying, be careful about what you wish, because if you have too much of an adversity history, or let's say too sensitive, uh, or adversity history has sensitized you so that feelings of calmness are no trigger, now triggers of threat, be careful, do things very slowly. And a lot of this I makes makes a lot of sense because in the world that we live in, we know many people who can't sit still. And we, by watching their behaviors, you know, we call it workaholic or highly anxious, we know that their bodies are literally fearful of immobilization. They feel that if they don't keep moving, they'll fall into that shutting down response. So we have to see the anxiety as a threat reaction with certain adaptive features, not bad. It's not to blame a person right. for being anxious. It's how they and their integrated nervous system have, are dealing with these vulnerabilities. Really but interesting. We can learn a lot from ourselves and from those around us. And the first thing we learn is we need to listen to ourselves and we need to be good witnesses of others. We can't make interpretations. We have to be, in a sense, be on a uh, data search where we're learning about things. Well, that takes us well into our next question, um, which has a long preamble, I will warn you. Okay, so uh, people with chronic illnesses that are invisible and who have had inconclusive test results for medical evaluations mm. are often dismissed. Yeah. And this gaslighting adds trauma and confusion to already disabling sim symptoms this happens in the ER with urgent symptoms as well as with outpatient providers. I mean, people really struggle with this trauma when care is sought in what should be a safe healing place, but instead they find a non-safe environment and care providers who dismiss ridicule or just shrug at symptom presentation. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice either about how to preclude the trauma or how to deal with the trauma that results from gaslighting, which I should say, all of us have experienced. Well, I am part of a kind of a think tank that is actually discussing this. And, and I got invited into this. I did anticipate this group, but they're a group of physicians dealing with chronic illness and chronic pain. It's exactly what you're saying. And they have, uh, for many of them, they've quit their practice because they couldn't practice medicine in the way that they wanted, which was to talk to their patients, create relationships. And medicine is not merely treatment, although that's how the billing codes are. Yeah. Medicine is really predicated on being safe or the uh, practitioner and the patient 
having a safe relationship, we we'll call it trust. And what's happening, the trauma is that there's a violation of that trust, but it's a violation on both sides. When you are a practitioner, and I'm not a physician and I'm not a practitioner, but when you are, you're getting all the wonderful positive feedback from your patients when you're helpful. It's co-regulation. And what's happening in the medical community is burnout. People don't like their jobs. Uh, they're under financial pressure. It's, it is really, it's ugly. And people are committing suicide within medical practice. And during the pandemic, it's a pressure cooker. Right. So, so the part is the system is wrong. I mean, and there are many people who acknowledge it. And the question is, how do you change the system? You want to know how can you deal with the individual? I'm trying to say, what can we do with the system? And I see basically two portals. One is changing medical education. And it, we created this not-for-profit called the Polyvagal Institute. And I decided that changing medical education was a high priority, but how do you do that? Okay. And I decided that I could only get this started by engaging academic physicians, physicians who were part of medical schools. So we have a committee, it's, I think it's about eight um, uh, academic physicians, and actually we're meeting again this week to try to develop strategies. So the idea is how do you get infuse this notion that it's the patient uh, physician interaction, which is part of the curing or the curative journey. Uh, which is part of the history of medicine, but has been Absolutely. removed from it and replaced with procedures and with, with pills. And yeah. so we're making progress. The other part is our institute is already working with a, uh, a, a company, a major uh, uh, company that uh, runs clinics. Uh, and what we're trying to do is in four of the clinics change the culture. Yeah, because there was a financial issue for this company and that was they were losing physicians and, and it was a HMO and they were losing the people that were signed up. So it's not like out of the goodness of the world to want to do this, but you know, it's a portal, it's an opening right. for us. And the idea is if we can demonstrate that there's more satisfaction in delivering, more satisfaction in the customer base, then this will spread into more clinics. Certainly, that is um, something you'll, you'll find a lot of support for in this group, um, the idea of finding holistic care or yeah. coordinated care across physicians is yeah. non-existent, and yet that's what we're in need of. Well, there's something you mentioned earlier in this okay. segment, and that was uh, when tests don't show anything. <laughs> now, the real issue is why should the test show anything? They're the last resort. They are tests of end organ damage. And again, this is a product of modern medicine. People don't think of organs as having nerves regulating them. They think of organs as being diseased. And the issue is disease is the end point. It's the last stage. So if the neural regulation of those organs are not supporting homeostatic function, then the organs will start getting diseased. Obvious. Where are the measures of neuroregulation right. of the or organs? Well, there aren't any other than the measurements of like neural neuroregulation of the heart through measures of heart rate variability. But in general, yeah. and interestingly, indices of heart rate variability are predictors or correlate with many types of illness. And the lack of specificity is something that the medical community and the federal funding agencies do not like. Right. They want specificity. Right. And what the measurement keeps telling you is autonomic dysfunction, dysautonomia, or atypical autonomic function is the bedrock of right. many, many diseases, not just cardiovascular ones, but including cancer and, of course, GI issues. And neuropathies, yeah, which well, a lot of us suffer from, right? Yeah. Well, think about what a neuropathy is. It's a turning off of a feedback system. Right, right, right. And go back to the whole notion of a culture that says, contain those feelings. Don't share them. Don't describe them. Turn off your feedback loops. What is that saying? Contain feelings. Don't express them. Turn off what your autonomic nervous system is telling you. Polyvagal theory says, 
honor what your body's telling you, and then navigate in a complex world. So you're not as subservient to the feelings, but you understand that the body can suppress feelings for periods of time uh, as long as it has time in which it doesn't suppress it. So you could potentially, you know, do your work day, do your school day, do whatever you're doing. And then you have a couple hours with friends and with loving companions. Uh, and then your nervous system re equilibrates. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you're fine. Right. We can, we can deal with that. Our, our nervous system, but even the word stress, we get so confused with, we think of, of good stress, bad stress. What we're really saying is if we challenge the feedback loops, the homeostatic right. process, and they recover, everything's great. If right. they don't recover, they stay stuck, that's stress. So is there any research that you're aware of that uh, is really looking at polyvagal informed therapy specifically for people with long COVID? And if there's not any specific research, what would you like to see in this area? Well, there, no, there's no structured research that I know about, but there's, I would use the term hodgepodge of people curious about this. And because the, uh, the base of individuals who are, who have actually over 4,000 people have been trained in delivering uh, the safe and sound protocol. And at any given time, there's over 2,000 who are providers. So we know that even within that uh, database, there are people who have suffered it, uh, COVID. And we know that their client base, you know, so just multiply that by 10 to 100, you're talking about tens of thousands of people. So we know that people are asking for this. We also know that the acoustic stimulation functions as if it were an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. So we know that we can get at the same systems through sound. And we know that uh, this is where the research I would love to see go is to see how it deals as an anti-inflammatory. So uh, because that's a measurement that people are basically seeing. And in fact, with COVID, inflammation was really what got people. But we have to understand what inflammation is all about. It's the body trying to deal with a pathogen, with, a, with an intruder, with threat. And this is the way it does it. Right. Of course. Um, if so uh, if people want to benefit from polyvagal ideas and therapy, but can't find a local provider, um, can you tell us about resources? And if there are no, if they can't access therapy, are there ways to yeah. try this on their own? Yeah. Well, we, <laughs> it, we all try things on our own, but there's certain things that we shouldn't. And one is, you know, we need to, well, we, especially the people who are listening, the first premise is, can you create a safe place? Are you safe where you are? And then that co-regulation. Yeah, and well, for some people, they feel safe where they are, but once they go into any place of even co-regulation, it's too much. Uh, and what's interesting in, during the pandemic, uh, the delivery of services through the internet. So also there are providers who deliver the safe and sound protocol through the internet. And it's been quite effective, especially with people who carry histories because they don't have to now go out in public. The resource for education is our not-for-profit Polyvagal Institute. And you can see the website is polyvagalinstitute, one word, dot org. And there's courses online. Uh, for the safe and sound protocol, uh, it's, if you go to my personal webpage, there's a, uh, a link to the company. The company is Integrated Listening Systems. It's part of Unite Health. And that, my personal webpage is stephenporges.com. Uh, uh, one word also. But uh, I don't know if there are special, I'd say people specializing in uh, long COVID. I just don't know that. Uh, there are also uh, within the yoga community, within the, I think there are at least breathwork people. There are going to be many who are working with people on breathwork. And breath is an interesting variable. So important. Because we have a degree of intentionality over it, but it's also automatic on a certain level. We're not conscious when we're breathing, when we sleep, but we can in a sense engage and regulate our autonomic nervous system through 
conscious, intentional breathing. And the simple way of thinking about that is when I inhale, I turn off the vagal input to my heart. And when I exhale, I put it back on. So it doesn't turn it totally off, but it, it modulates it. But the point meaning if I extend the durations of my exhalations, right. I'll calm down. Spaces. If I extend the durations of my inhalations, I'll get tightly wrapped or other people will. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great point to bring up. Um, breath work is, is just so important. Can I, can I ask yeah. you this? How do we communicate polyvagal ideas in a trauma-informed way about the mind-body connection yeah. so it doesn't incorrectly result in having physical symptoms labeled as psychosomatic? Oh, okay. So let's get back to really, I think the real question is, is what you're calling gaslighting or being dismissed right. when you have symptoms that do not have direct correlates and objective measurements. Exactly. Okay, so the, the part is to understand, or at least to acknowledge that the nervous system, uh, it starts off or has a major component above our, our neck, it's our brain, but it's also the nerves that go back and forth uh, to our organs. So there's not a mind-body separation, which is what often happens in medicine. We're basically treated as if we're an automobile and we can fix that organ. Um, we're a one nervous system. And interestingly, uh, the concept of an integrated unitary nervous system that had both peripheral and central was, has been well known for decades, if not longer. So a individual by name of Walter Hess in 1949 got the Nobel Prize for documenting that literally that the brain regulated visceral organs. And interestingly, uh, his opening uh, paragraph in his Nobel Prize speech is, is very, very new agey. He talks about everything being related to everything else. And the notion is that, you know, meaning that older brain circuits influence newer ones, body influences brain. It's very contemporary, but it died. People weren't interested in it because it didn't fit into the concepts that were easily taught, which is really now much of medicine is symptom drug. Yeah. And hyper-specialization. Yeah. Well, I, uh, over a decade ago, it's almost 20 years ago, I guess, I interviewed to, for an administrative position at the National Institutes of Health. I had an interview with the director and I said to him directly, I said, we know too much to allow medicine to be practiced the way it is. I said, our job is really to recruit the patient's nervous system as a collaborator on a shared journey towards health. And not and all that, pathology, right? Also wellness, right? Well, well, health. The issue health, is, right. yeah, uh, when you understand health, right. uh, the, the issue is we live in a world, whether we're in a sense mental oriented or psychiatric oriented, we live in a world of comorbidities and that's stupid to begin with. So like in the world of psychiatry, people have comorbidities. But then if you go down the hall or to the next floor, you go to an internist, well, those mental health symptoms have comorbidities in gut and heart and skin right. and, and neurology. And so the issue is you have an organized nervous system that's responding to threat. <laughs> and right. once we acknowledge that, uh, that we need to reverse that to optimize the nervous system's ability to regulate this amazing uh, aquarium of systems, whatever term we use, right. uh, with our with body and sense to um, honor them and to optimize them, then we can truly get to what are the real diseases that could be treated with the treatments that we have uh, science has really identified with surgery right. and with drugs and you right. know. So, such sage uh, advice, and um, I, I hope we see our medical system moving in that direction. Um, be, be patient. <laughs> be, <laughs> be, well, be patient. I mean, the yeah, issue is... It's hard, is, but it's, I mean, it's been two years that a lot yeah. of us have been sick, which makes yeah. it more difficult. Yeah, but yeah. Let's, let's step back for a moment and, and ask the self-care part, and it starts with self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And it means that uh, and that means self-compassion for what your body and your nervous system is trying to do for you right. before you externalize it and get angry 
That's a, a good system, point. And yeah. a system that can't help you. Right. Basically, I have compassion for the medical profession. They just don't know. It's not a question of intentionality. Or the system a, doesn't allow it, right? I mean, the it, system says it, you've got 15 minutes. It, 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 the, if we start with that, but the knowledge base doesn't go to where True. one would True. want it to go. And that's why people are, let's say, walking to alternatives or more integrated programs. Mm -hmm. But the idea is we really would like to see a compassionate medical a system sure. created and it wouldn't take that much. It basically says we need to uh, respect the value of sociality as a neuromodulator that promotes health. And sociality starts with the receptionist. It starts, it doesn't start with the physician. It starts with the culture that you have mm -hmm. to engage someone who's in a state of threat. And I would say that the educational system is all the same. Everything in medicine, everything in education is evaluation. Right. And evaluation and assessments are triggers of feelings of threat. Sure. So how do you learn? Especially if it's being heal? questioned, right? Mm -hmm. How do you learn? How do you heal when you're under threat? So the, you've, you've talked about social needs. The pandemic has made it difficult to balance our social needs with the risk of becoming infected with COVID. And this is really magnified for people with long COVID, especially with the lifting of the mask mandates. How do you view this issue how do you, do you have suggestions for helping long COVID patients find that balance between their need for safety and their need for socialization? Well, first of all, I'm going to start off by being very compassionate to, to people out there and saying, look, I, I understand that this is, that your nervous systems are retuned to see the world and respond to the world as if it is a threatening place because for your nervous system, it is, we have to start there. I can even acknowledge that I am, I have not gotten COVID, but I've isolated from the world. But even in doing that, I mean, my wife lives with me. I shouldn't say I isolate totally from the world and I do Zooms, but I really haven't traveled, which was my normal way of interacting in the world. But what we have to understand is that our nervous systems retune under these settings. So for me, I'm much more hypervigilant and I'm still at being more hypervigilant. I'm notches below my wife's hypervigilance. My wife, you know, you know, she'll stay home. I would, I want to go to happy hour somewhere. I want to go out. I want to see people. Right. Uh, but, you know, she has a different nervous system. And what I'm saying is let's honor that. Let's not get angry at it. Let's start there. And then let's ask, how can we do it? Now, what I am going to do for my own rehabilitation, I am stepping out in a couple of months to do a couple in-person talks. I'm going to see how my nervous system handles that. Now, I've been trying to uh, organize talks in my local community here, which I, I live in North Florida, and I have finally been able to do that, but it won't be till July. And I thought I could do it sooner, and that would be on my journey of rehabilitation, because I am still, I want to be in front of people or with people or interacting, but I feel uncomfortable. Right. I, yeah, I do and, too. And I'm not in a <laughs> sense, comp well, also I'm suffering from what many people who have long COVID have, and that is fear of exhaustion. You don't want to go in place because you feel you might want to just take a nap. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you um, if you could, if you could intervene early into long COVID, say in the first three months using polyvagal informed therapies, what would that look like? And how would that intervention change for the patients who's one to two years into their illness? I, I think the only difference with the, let's do the latter one is that we are, we might say we're more locked into habit because we have associations built. And so our, our images, our memories are in a sense keeping us kind of imprisoned. I think the secret comes with cues of safety. Can we get cues of safety into our body? Okay. Can we do that through pets? Can we do that through breathing? Is Zoom uh, the initial portal that we spend some time on a social way? Can we get into proximity, even though we might sit across from a table at a distance? Can we get bodies in proximity to each other? Uh, I think 
the world of long COVID is very much like Lyme's disease world or chronic fatigue. And that is the same kind of thing. The message has not been received. The body still thinks it's under threat. What do you I, think about viral persistence in uh, long COVID? If the brain's not getting the message from um, autoantibodies, chemical responses, low oxygen and tissues and organs caused by microclots, viral remnants or viral persistence in long COVID. What do you think about that kind of thing? First of all, everything okay. is possible, but let's take parsimonious bit. Let's just say, uh, if my body is in a state of threat, are these things naturally emerging properties that will occur? So will I, will I be more sensitive? Will I have, in a sense, rather than uh, uh, my body not reacting to certain viral inputs, is it now hyper-reactive? Right. So, so the, I mean, it's like uh, uh, sensitivity. So people, like when people have certain histories or they suffer from certain types of of issues, they can't walk into certain buildings. Their systems are hypersensitive. There's a retuning of the nervous system to detect threat, even when the threat is not a threat, even when the the, the stimuli or the context is not a threat to others. So I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is, or I think what people are wondering um, in these questions is, you're saying on one hand, um, like past trauma is a factor and that our need to feel safety, our bodies need to feel safety. Mm -hmm. our, our body has these symptoms that it's expressing. I think what people are, are asking about is, but what does that mean about something that's causing, like the etiology, like well, blood clots or viral persistence? How does that, you know? Well, you see, if you, I, I, I'm always going to deflect that one and basically say, uh, we, we don't want to uh, think that everything has a specific, predictable, 100% causal relationship. We live in a world that assumes cause and effect relationships. It doesn't appreciate the individual differences of the system in which that causal cue is affecting it, meaning our physiology, our nervous system. Okay. So we look for a reliable, if this does something to one person, it should do it to everyone. This is not going to be the case because we have differential nervous systems that are basically buffering this. And we have to think differently uh, about our resilience and about our vulnerabilities. People who have long COVID had uh, in general, now we can't get causal, that totally causal in general, had a vulnerability uh, when they got the infection. So they, it's like the nervous system was primed to react and overreact. Okay. And we, this is going to be the story that will come out. And that is, it's already coming out in terms of pre-existing conditions. Uh, like we do know that asthma is a pre, because it at least with the earlier forms of COVID. So we, we know that the, autonomic nervous system is one of the uh, flags of, mm -hmm. of vulnerability. Sure. We know that obesity is, lead, of course, leads to all kinds of more mortality and morbidity issues. That also is, is a autonomic feature that will come up. You are not obese without having it manifested in challenges to your autonomic nervous system. So I like to keep the thoughts of saying, can I not, as I said, uh, can I build a model in which if my body is feeling safer, it has more resource to both protect me and to fight internal reactions. Right. And most so of So you're all, increasing your resources and your resilience and your right. body's able to perhaps deal with the clots or the viral persistence or whatever we, else it is we, that's causing the problem. We hope so. That, that would be the model because if remember that what the magic word homeostatic functions or homeostatic resources means, it's our ability for uh, health, growth, and restoration, our ability to repair. And when our bodies are out of homeostatic, uh, optimal homeostasis, then those resources aren't there. And that is disease. Right. So if we are in chronic disease, we're saying that the homeostatic functions of our body are compromised. So let's flip it around and say, if I can enhance the homeostatic functions, my body becomes a different organism that's much more resilient. Sure, that makes sense. Um, 
there's a question uh, about how one gets their insurance to cover the SSP protocol. Well, in the, I can't really tell you since I, 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 I will, I, well, first of all, I am uh, arm's length from anything that deals with business. It's, it's, a, it's licensed on my technology, but I'm not quote involved in the business. Um, there are, uh, I know in the mental health arena, there are people who are mixing it with other forms of treatment. And they're using, when they do that, they're having no problem billing. So, and there are people who are intermixing as the safe and sound protocol with somatic experiencing, with EMDR, with a variety, in fact, with a variety of ones, so that they're using it to calm the body, to facilitate their trauma therapies. Right. And if they do this mix, I don't think there's any problem. I don't know what the, it, uh, the OTs, do it in a different way. There are a lot of occupational therapists because the initial uh, use of it was with children who had auditory hypersensitivities. And I, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, I, you know, what, we're, what, uh, what the company is trying to do is they now have uh, assessments online. They're trying to create a database of several thousand assessments to go to the insurance companies. That's great. That's great. And, along, and we'll take this as our last question since I am mindful of the time. Um, for research and clinical care, do you think that long COVID clinics should be using assessment tools that the Polyvagal Institute uses? In other words, would it help to more accurately capture a patient's experience with long COVID from a trauma informed perspective? I, I of course, uh, there are simple tools like I developed uh, it's a, a scale called the body perception questionnaire. And that is, that's very predictive in our COVID studies. It's really telling you whether your autonomic nervous system has been retuned. It's on my webpage and the scoring manual is there and people can just download it and use it. Um, so I think that's the, the first step is as, uh, acknowledging that your autonomic nervous system is destabilized or fine. So it, it maps quite nicely the, the linear relationship between adversity history and uh, the body perception questionnaire. Right. Uh, but virtually, as I said, virtually all the predictive variants of adversity history is carried by asking the person about their autonomic state. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Porges, hey, for generous, generously answering our many questions. Yeah, let, let and, me, um, yeah, let me just we greatly make, appreciate uh, your time. Yeah, I'd like to make a final comment. Greatly because, a, a final comment regarding. Greatly long. appreciate your time and incredible expertise. On behalf of Body Politic, the grassroots organization at the forefront of the patient led movement for long COVID, thank you, Dr. Porges. Oh, you, you're welcome. And a big thank you to everyone who has joined us today, wherever you are. Um, we are an entirely volunteer run organization made up largely of COVID-19 long COVID patients. If you'd like to support our work, please contribute to the GoFundMe campaign that is uh, linked in the video description. And uh, thank you and well, good afternoon. You're welcome. I'd like to make one final comment. And that is, I uh, first of all, I think the first thing for long COVID is to get to kind of not get too scared and have an optimistic perspective and to realize that the function or the limitations of function are really state related. You had a shift in neuroregulation. And so it doesn't have to be a destiny. And the question is, can your body internalize a sense of safety? And can this be nurtured? And you're saying, yes, absolutely it can. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the other thing is, I I would like this is something I would like you to do with with your constituency, and that is, uh, have them fill out the body perception questionnaire right. and collect that data and look at that distribution. That sounds like a great idea, and we do very much look forward. It's so refreshing to hear your perspective um, as you know a, a long COVID patient myself who has experienced many instances of being told, you know. What I'm feeling is all in my head. And um, yeah, it's very refreshing to hear not only your perspective on polyvagal theory, but also your perspective on healthcare 
and uh, having that uh, patient physician um, collaboration in, in, in treatment and uh, I think it's going there. And uh, there are two, two points. One is we're a loving species, we're a co-regulatory species. And the other one is we're a traumatized species. And this creates this dialectic. And we have to acknowledge as a culture that there's too many cues of threat. And we have to since, uh, bombard ourselves at least in safe places with cues of safety. Right. Right. I just, as I, the I, treatment. As the treatment. As the treatment. And uh, hopefully in the therapeutic environment that yeah. is safe and where there's a person yeah. has been trauma informed and trained. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Really. Thank you so much. Um,